All right. All right. Just yeah, there we go. waiting for it. This is live for me. Okay. Uh, I think we're good to go. Everybody, welcome to podcast number three. This is Project SIP. We finally came up with a name, as you can see. Um, so we're going to stick with that for basically as long as shelter in place lasts. And uh, we're happy to have you guys all here on this Thursday night. I uh, want to start off by introducing two new people we've got to the podcast. We've got uh, Hannah Weldon. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Hannah. Um, I work as an assistant, as an administrative assistant at a school. I have a background in tutoring and anthropology, and um, my political views are left-leaning. I'm a fan of Bernie Sanders. And um, I grew up in South Georgia, have a strong family background of religious folk, and I am not religious. Awesome. Thanks for that intro. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, down at the bottom, we have uh, Charles. How are you doing, Charles? Go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm doing fine. Yes. Um, my name is Charles, and I work for VA System for 15 years. Five more years, and then I'll be out of here. I'm a veteran. Of, uh, I'm a boiler plant operator, sta stationary engineer. So, married, enjoying life. Political views is uh, pretty much independent. I'm a fan of Bernie, but I don't know about who, uh, what's going to happen on this next election. <laughs> Thank you, man. Uh, appreciate that introduction there. Uh, all right. So uh, to start us off here, going to go over to uh, Lewis for the first topic. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Alex. Um, so I just kind of wanted, before we jump into that, I just wanted to remind everybody what the current stats are for the coronavirus. Uh, America is almost at 1.5 million cases and just about to reach 90,000 deaths. Um, it's quite an increase from the previous two uh previous podcast numbers um so hopefully everything is everybody's doing what they can to minimize th this increase um and that being said that ties into our first uh topic here of the coronavirus and how it's doing or what it's doing to our criminal justice system namely the prisons and jails um you know what i i kind of want to go to Hannah on this one here uh, for the first question, and we'll just kind of pass around as needed. Um, you know, what should be done about the current and current jail and prison populations um, now that it's actually made its way into the system here? Um, do you feel like there would be additional risks to public health if um, we either keep the prisoners where they're at right now, or if they should be released back into the general community? So there's, I think there needs to be a combination of, of uh, steps taken for those criminals that are incarcerated and have been and are there because it was that they need to be there. Um, extra measures I feel like should be taken in uh, safety within the facility itself. So more time between smaller groups moving between different activities in the day, whether it be going outside or going to the food areas, um, more limitations on being within their cells or within their personal spaces to aid in safety. Um, and then for the people that are, maybe they haven't, maybe have smaller infractions or um, not felonies type issues, uh, there could be an option of having them go stay in a place within the actual county itself if, if it's the type where they can be trusted to do this and things like um, bracelets that track their movement and keep them within a certain radius of an area that they're supposed to be. So I think there's a variety of measures that could be taken. Okay. Um, I wanted to pass that to Charles, but it seems like he's having a little issue there. Uh, let's see here. Um, Jules, do you feel like um, there should be 
uh, limits on the, the type of inmate that we would release? Or would you feel that everybody should stay um, right where they're at? I mean, I feel like there probably should be limits in terms of uh, highly dangerous individuals, um, people who are maybe even more volatile. Uh, I don't think we should be releasing, you know, everyone. Uh, it, it should be more, uh, it should probably be more by the nature of uh, what they're in for. So more minor crimes, misdemeanors, uh, drug offenses. Yeah, let's let them go. You know, uh, keep tracking them as uh, Hannah Walden said. Um, more and create room so there can be more space between the much more dangerous people that that ought to be incarcerated still. Okay, um, Amanda, you had some some thoughts to add to that? Uh, yeah, so um, for anybody new who's watching, I'm a public defender in Northern California. So um, what's been happening in California is the um, mandatory bail schedule was changed to an emergency bail schedule, meaning that, you know, if something was normally $50,000 bail, now it's zero dollars. And they only did that for nonviolent offenses um, and low level felonies. Not all misdemeanors are included. If it's domestic violence, it doesn't qualify. If it's a DUI, it doesn't qualify. If it's something that uh, involves a felon with a firearm, it doesn't qualify. So um, at least for California and um, similar states, what's happening is only the nonviolent people are being released if they have pending cases. If they are already sentenced, what a lot of places are doing is trying to see if they can release them early to something like an ankle monitor or um, some other alternative program. Um, but it's, um, there is obviously a lot of pushback because some people, when they get out, they do reoffend, um, And we see articles about that. And so we have to figure out a way to balance, you know, not only public safety in terms of somebody being victimized by somebody who was released as part of these orders, but also public health. Because when you have people crammed into to these spaces with no pro personal protective equi equipment, um, they don't do proper disinfecting, they can't socially distance, many of them are not in cells, they do pods, they do dorm style housing in a lot of prisons and jails. Um, it makes it so that if they get sick and they get out, they can give it to somebody else and, and spread it to the community. And so that's one of the reasons why it is important to try to get as many people out as possible who aren't going to present a violent risk to the public, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense, yeah. Um... Robert, do you agree with that? Uh, I, I kind of do on the libertarian aspect, but uh, I do have some disagreements with uh, the fact that we uh, have already seen criminals who have been released and within the first 30 minutes, they're back out on the streets committing carjackings. They go back to jail, they get released again, they end up recommitting crimes. Um, so I'm all for prison reform and uh, releasing criminals, but I think that there has to be a proper rehabilitation. And I feel like the coronavirus doesn't really implement the, the proper rehabilitation that criminals need. And so a lot of the times you see criminals getting re-released and re-offending within minutes, hours of, of their release. Um, so I think that there's a, a proper balance that needs to be enforced for for criminals to be released. Well, and uh, if you don't mind my jumping in again, um, carjacking itself is, is considered a violent crime. It's vehicle theft using force or fear. So that is not eligible for release. But, um, you know, I have seen articles about people getting released and stealing cars or committing theft. Um, I personally think if, if it's true, if those charges are true, that that's probably one of the dumbest things that they can do because they're gonna end up back in court on all those charges. They're gonna get longer prison sentences in the end. Um, but if somebody is getting out and they are committing a violent offense or an offense that is otherwise on the list of exceptions for lower bail, they're staying in. Um, and what we do need to remember is that a lot of the people who are being affected by this uh, in terms of release orders are people who have largely not been convicted and are still presumed innocent. 
Um, I completely agree with you, Robert, about lack of rehabilitation. I think that could be an entire podcast on its own in terms of the, Definitely. Uh, the, the prison system in the United States and how it, uh, it punishes instead of fixes people. And we don't look at the underlying problems of you know, the fact that incarceration has so many public health issues underlying it. But um, you know, the, the people who are getting out and immediately reoffending are in the minority. Um, and, you know, there are counties that are trying to implement ways, like Hannah mentioned, to track people with GPS. In Sacramento County, where I work, they don't have that capability right now, but people are being ordered to report to probation, um, you know, every week. They're searchable, so they have limited Fourth Amendment rights while they're released during the pendency of their case. So, um, you know, it is about striking a balance, and it's, it's tough when there is such a great public health risk by keeping people in jail. Very well, good. So Amanda, um, we got a question coming in from Facebook here for you. Um, Christian Blake says, is there any data around recidivism rate for those released under these circumstances? I don't think we have that yet, especially because people aren't really going to court. The courts are largely closed. Mm -hmm. um, so if people are reoffending, we don't have the data yet. Nothing has been reported to us, you know, uh, from the police departments. Um, but I know overall crime rates are going down and that has more to do with, I think, the stay at home orders um, than it does with, you know, who is getting released from the jails. Um, but on the flip side, the stay at home orders are increasing instances of domestic violence and child abuse. So, um, you know, in terms of reoffending, we, we just don't have the data yet. I will say from my own anecdotal personal experience, I, I have dozens of clients and not a single one who's been released has reoffended and I haven't heard of many in my county where that's happening, but I know it's happening. I just couldn't give you the data. Gotcha. Um, Want to go to uh, Kyla next. Uh, you had something to say on this. Well, on, on this, I really wanted to go on in, on, a, on a deeper level. And so, you know, everything happens for a reason. Everything has a reaction. And so, you know, let's take the clock back 30, 35 years to, to current criminal justice policy. Uh, you know the the war on the war on drugs, uh, zero tolerance, three strike laws. We've propagated um, a, a hard line, no nonsense, lock everybody up mentality. And now, in the midst of this pandemic, these chickens are coming home to roost. You know, when we have a majority of people who are in jails, uh, who are in prison, are mostly a lot of nonviolent offenders, a lot of first time offenders, a lot of drug offenses um, that are people you know in for for marijuana that are serving. 10, 15 years, depending on the state that you work in, um, you know, that's what we're doing when we're, you know, filling up our prisons and, and propagating the spread of this virus, you know, it, it all goes back to this mentality. And I think, you know, true criminal justice reform, you know, must start with the legalization of marijuana and, and, and drugs. You know, we, we have to stop locking people up for, for drug offenses. It's, it, it's nonsense. It doesn't solve the problem. It drains our resources. And honestly, it, it propagates the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. I want prisons for rapists, murderers, violent criminals. Um, I don't care who smokes weed. I don't care who does coke. You know, honestly, we have to utilize and marshal our resources in a better way. And I, I think instead of having people in jail on drugs, filling prisons, now all of a sudden getting the virus going up, you know, we need to say, let's take this opportunity. Unfortunately, it's during a pandemic, but we have to utilize opportunities to reassess our entire society, um, the way we do business, the, the way we, we, we work, you know, to try to find a better way because, you know, we need to learn from history and history is telling us right now that mass incarceration for nonviolent drug offenses is not the way to go. And so that's the point that I wanted to make as it pertains to COVID-19 and criminal justice in general. Yeah, and that's a great point, Kylan. Uh, really appreciate you jumping in there. Um, Charles, I want to get you in on this uh, next. What do you think about um, about the current prison population as it relates to COVID-19? Make sure you unmute yourself, man. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Yeah. Are you ready? Okay, perfect. You know what? I, I, I have a problem with, with uh, some of the release they're doing. Like the guy, Trump's guy, that's going to be at home for six months. I mean, four years on the office. You know, when you have other people that's in there for marijuana, they're not even be considered. And let me just identify myself. I'm I'm 12 years in the penitentiary in Texas. Okay. 
okay? And it was for nothing that really I felt uh, uh, was, um, I should have been in jail for. But what I do know is people that's going to jail for drugs, they need to go to rehab because they're just taking up space. Yes, rehab costs more money, but you're not doing anything, just putting them in jail and then letting them back off right where they left off. You know, um, as far as during the, uh, during this uh, this time, I'm I don't know. I've seen some people like the guy in Oakland that uh, uh, ghost ship guy. They talk about letting him out. Okay, he's not a violent offender. I'm gonna disagree but his there. Cases of violence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. You know, his case is right. Okay, so and that, with that said, he should still be there. And some of these people that's in there for DUI or, or other, any other drug, I say that they should say it first. You know, and it's a lot of favoritism as far as who's going to get out and who's not. And Charles, who how, has how, the money. Real quick, I, and I appreciate that point you made right there. How do you... Um, how do you solve the issue of coronavirus running rampant in these prisons right now? Actually, they need to go ahead and test everyone in there, including the guards, the ones that, that test positive. They need to move out into a, to a separate, uh, a separate uh, structure. And the ones that are not, they have them all separated somewhere else. But they need the ones that test positive need to be in like a semi-medical unit where they can be tested every day to see what's going on and they shouldn't be put together but, but to do, do that the system has to be sanitized you got to sanitize it or even moving them won't help and that's one of the things that people aren't considering just because you take someone out that has COVID-19 you still leaving the trace of the uh, disease in there. Okay. Very, very uh, good point. Appreciate that. Um, Want to jump over to uh, Jake real quick. Wanted to make a point on this topic. So, if we were talking about uh, testing everybody in all the prisons and moving the people who test positive to another facility, we run into the obvious problem of what other facility? Where are we going to put them? And uh, I, I'm going to rope that back to what I, I always do. We live in a scarcity world where the most of the money is hoarded by a, a handful of extremely rich people or extremely rich companies. And if we, we could just tax those people, we could build a hospital wherever we need one. China reacted to this by building gigantic hospitals, and we, we haven't done anything like that. But to be fair, we, we've erected like massive um, tented hospitals in like, uh, for example, like in New York. They erected a big uh, tented hospital facility in um, Central Park, I believe is what it was called. Yeah. Javit, I mean, okay, Javit sure. Center. And that was Javit Center. Center. Yeah. Yeah. Does that compare to building a 10,000 person hospital? No, it doesn't. But oh, it, 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 so far from doing nothing, do that's that. what I'm saying. Yeah, no, you're right. We're not doing time. nothing, but we are being outshone. And I think we could but, do a lot better. Yeah, but China isn't expecting that hospital to be around for more than a couple months. Uh, they're not building it to it's, last. It's kind of the same idea yeah. as like, a country that won the right to host the Olympics, building huge facilities and then letting them rot as soon as the Olympics exactly. are over. You know what I mean? Well, except that it's spending hard when you need a, a, a thing to get you through. Right now, those kinds of things are are, are, are gonna solve a problem. We have a mm -hmm. bunch of prisoners. We If we could spread them out by moving half of them to other facilities, we could give them personal space so that six foot rules could be, you know, one person to a cell or whatever make the situation as humane as it can possibly be so we're not losing humanity as this happens to us. No, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So, Jake, and how do you feel like we should balance uh, human rights and also the personal health of everybody in the jails, also trying to maintain uh, general public safety there? Who is that to? I mean, oh, oh. No, that was Jake. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I mean, okay, so if, if, if we could... Uh, build functional facilities to move them into something that kind of blends the worlds between a hospital because we're talking about those that have tested positive and, and a prison because they're still prisoners. Uh, 
um, spreading them out so that they're still under lockdown, but not, you know, packed in like sardines, uh, guards become the most dangerous part of it. Am I, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I, I hear you. Um, I think if we could spread them out, we, we sorry, I just got to track back to where I was saying. Um, the guards become the the most the most prevalent problem because they get they get to leave the prison and then go back in. So they're hitting you know grocery stores and and McDonald's and and seeing their family and neighborhood kids and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So if those people are getting tested regularly, then you've isolated a group of people, and as long as it doesn't get in, you can keep them that way. I, that's a tall order, but I think that's that would be a great direction to go. Yeah. Good point. Uh, I, I would say it's more of a problem of the prisoners mm -hmm. coming into the prison that potentially have it than the guards. And well, then the guards we're not getting get a lot of crime from... right now. And there's True. still crime. There's still crime. There's still stuff happening. Um, I, it, it, Amanda, it's I, been I, months since we've had a school shooting, hasn't it? Well, oh, <laughs> I man. Mean, yeah, that's, well, that's a sad trophy to have. Yeah, that, I know. I don't know if that's something we want to hang our hat on, though. But No, I not mean, at all. No, that wasn't the intention. <laughs> <laughs> but there's still stuff happening, and there's still people going into the system. So we also have to worry about the people coming into the system. So we still have to isolate those people. But I, the, the question is, is do we, have enough, do we have enough resources to be able to put them in, like, a facility outside of the prison for the time being until they've been tested, quarantined, and then moved into the general public or the prison population. And I can tell you they're not, they're not really screening people coming in. Um, some counties are, at least in California, are going to start doing that only if people have to go to a physical courthouse. Um, and a lot of places, you know, it, the testing is not very, you know, there's not as much as there needs to be. And um, they're, when they are testing, it's like 70%, 90% of people tested have it in the prison. So um, it's very difficult to really tell what the impact is because they're not doing enough testing and they're not doing enough screening. They're not doing enough quarantining of people. Um, and I don't think many sheriffs, at least for local jails, are being very transparent about it. Here in Sacramento, our sheriff said, we don't have any cases. Yet in federal court, it turned out there were positive cases in our jail um, the same day he was saying there wasn't. So um, there isn't a lot of transparency. And it's, you know, we can't just say we're going to put people in other facilities because we don't have them. That's the, kind of the problem there. Let's get, uh, let's get Charles in real quickly. He's had his hand raised for a while. Yeah, I, I just want to say, you know, you don't have to take the prisoners out of the system. Every every major prison has a gigantic wreck area, inside and outside. Now, you can put those tents out on that wreck area or one of the wreck areas and maybe the gym. That's always the problem. If you got people that are... Uh, if the population is more than... With the with the uh, disease, then without, then leave them in, and the ones that are not, move them out. Because That's really good thinking. You're gonna have to break it down to one person at a, one person per cell, and the gym is gonna be the only other place that you'll be able to put them. I believe. Interesting. Realistically, since prisons are already really packed and resources are considered significantly short. Um, that's a fantastic modification here. We, we have to consider what is gonna spend the least amount of money because that's probably the most realistic. Great point, great point. Um, I got a question on Facebook from uh, Will Curtis. He wants to know um, how, um, how does the state or what can the state do better to sanitize these prisons and county jails? For the people who are incarcerated um go ahead. so just because we've been doing interviews for our own clients um to try to get information about that you know one of the biggest things is they can just actually give them soap they can give them disinfectant 
Um, you know, at, at least in one of our county jails, you know, the, the showers are not disinfected every day. The tables are, get like a little spray and that's it in the day room. Um, they don't have paper towels to give to anybody. They don't have wipes to give to anybody. Making those things available is going to be the best way to disinfect things. Um, you know, they ask for things and they're told we don't have them, we're out or you don't get them. And that's a problem. It, it is a problem. And I mean, just to expound on that, you know, it's hard to get paper towels and wipes for us on the outside right now. You know, the supply chain is totally broken. Um, you know, and um, I believe just recently there was an uprising in one of the prisons where the prisoners, you know, were frustrated that they, they weren't getting any health care. Um, I believe I saw that on an episode of Vice. So, you know, this is something that's definitely going on within our within our prisons. You know, um, you know, there comes a point where people are still human beings, uh, and you know, people aren't animals. You know, there has to be some basic way to survive. And you know, I think our our prison system is very indicative of our society in general. You know, we, you know, pr prisons, you know, are overcrowded. There's not enough resources. People are treated like animals. That's, that's happening right now in our, in our country for people not in prison. There's not enough resources. Certain classes of people, certain ethnicities of people are treated like animals. Uh, certain people are, are treated like, you know, like they're less than other people. You know, you know, one segment of society gets more favorable treatment, both in resources as well as in law enforcement than other segments of society get. And so I, I really do think, you know, the prison system is very indicative of our current society at large. And I think that's a problem. Well put. Um, I want to go to uh, Robert next for this next uh, little topic here. Um, this kind of goes back to our uh, previous uh, podcast there with shelter in place protests there. Um, since we were uh, four people speaking out uh, with their first amendment rights, um, do you feel that the Sixth Amendment of a speedy trial is being uh, withheld from people that um, commit a crime? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, when when people are having to push back their court dates, uh, they're obviously not able to have their trial at, at, at the time that they wish. Um, I don't know if I can come up with a conclusion on how that would fix that other than, you know, maybe the court system holding, you know, what I've seen a lot do or they hold Zoom meetings for cases through. You know, Who else right? you're in that um, lag or yeah. a little yeah. Robot, robot action going on? Uh-oh. Thing. Robert, Robert hey, you your internet that phone, man. Jeez. No, dude. Is that is that better? That's better. Yeah, yeah that's well, better. I, I got to pull my computer a little closer to the internet. Okay, so what I was saying was that I, I think that uh, one of the ways that they could fix this is by having Zoom meetings that are held over the computer, where they have video meetings of holding court cases through the you know through the computer and through the internet, so people aren't getting uh, infected by a whole bunch of people in a courtroom. Uh, but I do definitely agree that people's Sixth Amendment rights are, are being withheld by people not having uh, the ability to hold their court cases in a timely manner. So who would you say would have the power to remove that particular right in an a extreme, certain, uh, extreme case, much like what's going on right now? Uh, well, as me being more of a conservative, I would say that that would be up to the governors. Okay. Isn't it the governors that have given that power, though? Well, isn't that what you guys are saying? Is it who would be the ones that would be able to change that? I, I think that would be something that the, the governors would, would have to agree to. Uh, I don't think the president has the overall authority to be able to change a whole structure of the, all the United States. We came up with this <clears throat> when they talk about how the president wasn't able to reopen the economy. It's the same kind of thing. It's up to the governors if they want to you know, change on how the court cases are being ran or stuff within their state is, is being held so i do think you, that this so can i ask a do you and i'm sorry if this got brushed over already but uh do you agree with uh the wisconsin supreme court's decision to strike down the governor's stay at home orders uh not necessarily i mean if the supreme court finds something unlawful i mean that's the whole point of the checks and balances 
So I haven't really looked too deep into it, but from what I know of, of a, a federal aspect of what the Supreme Court does is uh, that's the whole point of what they're there for is the checks and balances of how the president acts or how laws are enacted. So if, if the Supreme Court found something that was unlawful with how the governor constructed his stay at home, uh oh, his stay at home order, then uh, I can't really complain with that. That's so that's a lot of um, a lot of what I understand about that particular case um, is that uh, yes, I mean it was a majority rule Supreme Court decision, um, but it was largely on party lines. Um, yeah, I think it was like a four to three vote in favor of like reopening the government, like strictly. There on was party one lines. conservative that went with the liberals. Oh, there was. Okay. I didn't know that, but it largely on party lines. So I, I guess my question is, would you side with those conservatives that, um, that want to uh, reopen the state in lieu of, you know, protecting people's health? I, I guess, where do you fall there? Uh, I, I would fall more as, as being someone that, that the governor has, has more of the control. So, so I guess I, I would have to side I guess what you're saying is I would be siding against the Supreme Court, and I believe okay. that the governor has has more jurisdiction over what their state should be able to do. Okay. I mean, what the governor should be able to rule over their state. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Um, so I think uh, I want to move on to the next topic here. Uh, Amanda had to step away uh, for a second. Uh, and I know she, this is a topic that she's going to be particularly interested in, so hopefully it'll still be going by the time she gets back. Uh, but I want to uh, talk about the um, Ahmad Arbery case. Um, it's a case that, you know, as a lot of you know, is polarized the nation. Um, there are a lot of very strong opinions on that. So I wanted to start off by getting some opinions uh, uh, from a couple of you. So Kylan, what, what are your thoughts on the Ahmad Arbery case so far? Yeah, so, you know, my, my feelings on this are very strong. Um, so to understand the, the, the context of my feelings on this, you know, I, I come from not only just as an African-American male, I, I come from someone who has a son who's seven years younger, you know, and, and it can literally happen to him right now. You know, no one has the right to take the law into their own hands, you know, no one has the right to go and run somebody down and cut them off. And then, you know, when, when someone is trying to fight for their life, stand, trying to stand their own ground, they're killed for it. And then their character is tried to be assassinated once more. Um, you know, I'm trying to parse my words if I want to, but I sick of having to, of, of, of African-American males, African-Americans in general, having to justify your existence, having to justify to go run, having to justify to walk down the street, having to justify being in a certain neighborhood, have to justify um, shopping at a certain place, having to justify going swimming, having to justify eating at a certain place, you know, for fear of death, for fear of harassment, for fear of violence, you know, and so you know, this young man lost his life and he didn't have to. And if he was any other ethnicity, this, this, would, this, this ending would not have happened. Um, it wouldn't have taken two months for there to be an arrest. Um, the perpetrators wouldn't have been set loose. You know, the DA wouldn't have stepped in and said, no, go ahead and let them go. I, I, I know them, there's nothing here even though the Georgia investigators said at the time there was probable cause to apprehend them at the crime scene and they were overruled. You know, I just want justice to be equal. I want there to truly be equal justice under the law and have the law applied fairly and equally. You know, so I guess um, I'm gonna ask one uh, more question of Kylan here and then I wanna get to Charles here. Uh, Kylan, what do you say to the critics that say Ahmaud Arbery um, I, I think it was it was either in the days leading up or it was the same day. I can't remember which. But um, uh, what do you say to those critics who say, well, he he tried to uh, rob a neighbor's house um, the day before or in the days leading up to it? And you know, Georgia state law allows for a little more vigilante justice than most other states in the in the oh. nation do. So let's let's start by going to facts. One of the one of one of the gentlemen, um, the perpetrators, had that right 
he lost that right in 2019 because he didn't keep up with his firearm trainings and other certifications. So he actually lost that that's right. True. That's so, true. So that's so that's number one. Number two, um, I thought in this country we're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. So you know that's a little you know thing here. You know, Which is the Mike McMichael defense, by the way. Yeah. And so, the, so, wait. The the what? Jake, sorry. Mc, the, McMichael's lawyer is currently saying they have a presumption of innocence. Yep. Okay. So, okay. The people who shot him. Because they're because there's somebody dead in the ground right now that sure didn't get that presumption of innocence, and and, and so that's what I would say to those critics, um, because you know those critics didn't have it happen to a member of their family or one of their friends, and so they can't understand that. You know, I understand what it's like to have been harassed by police. I know what it's like to have lost family member to murder, to, to unjust violence. And so this is very personal for me, but again, it's also indicative of our society at large. Um, when you have a certain segment of society that is presumed innocent until proven guilty, and there's another segment of society that's guilty until proven innocent. That is not equal justice under the law. Well put, thank you. Let's go to uh, Charles and then I wanna get Hannah in next. Okay, yeah. Uh I was going to make the same points that uh, Tyler did, but my, my thing is the, the way that they're trying to twist it so that he can be, uh, so they can uh, desecrate his character, you know, that, that bothers me. And it happens every time there is a shooting of a black man, no matter what, you know, every time. And uh, my, my feeling is, he ran in the house and he ran right back out. He didn't take anything, yet they took his life. It wasn't their home. They didn't live there. They stopped in the middle of the street to, to take him down for running. You know, um, there's too much of that going on right now in the black communities down south, over in the in, uh, uh, over here on the West Coast and the East Coast. Mm. But, you know, uh, for the DA to say there's nothing there, on the, when it happened, it was uh, <laughs> very, very uh, strange until I, I started reading about it and finding out that uh, they had a personal relationship through work at some point. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just because I work with you, I'm supposed to defend you when you're wrong? No. That's not how this goes. Right. Um, what do you guys think of the application of the very controversial stand your ground law in this particular case? Does Georgia have a stand your ground law? They, I think they not, do. Because it, it's it's not a stand your ground, if I remember correctly. It's it's more of like you can do a citizen's arrest, and as long as they had proof of cause of a felony, they can chase him down. Mm -hmm. And that's what they were using in, in that they thought he had burglarized a house, but there's no proof of a burglar. I, I think even under a, a misdemeanor, you, you can actually c conduct a citizen's arrest. I don't think it has Oh yeah, to no, I'm not saying you can't do a citizen, citizen's arrest. You can't follow them. You can't chase them down unless it's a felony. And uh, they can definitely, they can definitely do a citizen's arrest and in Georgia, you can do that pretty much any time, but the, they were using the fact that um, a hearsay essentially that he had burglarized something. To, well, no, they, to chase they, had see, they had seen him. They uh, you can hear in McMichael's phone call that he says in the phone call that he had, he's that there's somebody entering a property and then you can hear him say he's running now. And you can see if you watch the video from the outside of the building, you can see uh, Ahmad walk into the building. And as he's walking out, a neighbor from across the street confronts Arbery and, and that's when he starts jogging. So there was definitely a, a witnessing of trespassing. There's just not- a, that's, a, that's, not a, that's not worth a felony even it's not it's not it's 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 a I mean, it's a miss it's a misdemeanor so then you can do a citizen's arrest but you can't follow somebody and chase them down and shoot them well, uh, well no matter yeah, but i don't think he was shot because because of the the stealing or the potential stealing he, he was 
I think he was shot because he had grabbed the other person's shotgun. That's what the McMichaels are claiming is that he had grabbed the shotgun. If and somebody himself, is pointing a shotgun at you, right. I, what, what would, I, what would I, you we do? We don't see we don't see that in the video. We don't see the McMichaels ever point the shotgun at Arbery. Would this ever have happened if they hadn't pursued him? None of this would have happened. They could have called uh, the police. I, 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 their, I agree. They could have done their job. You know, he didn't He didn't deserve to I mean, die. He was there's on no, the phone no with the police. There was, there was proof I mean, that there were, other people, there were other people who had also peeked their head inside. I, they, name I, a person I, who hasn't seen a construction site and hasn't peeked their head inside. He didn't take anything. He didn't. He wasn't. But, but you don't have to burglary. take. You don't have to take something for that to be a burglary. It's, it's just the intent. No, you have and to burglarize. No, no. You you, you, no let, let me let, let me explain this. Let me explain. I have it right here. First degree burglary is a felony with a legal entry with the intent to commit a theft. Now let me give you this example. If There's a burglar. No Hold, 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 hold on. Kylan, Kylan, let Robert you finish real quick. You don't have to have intent by actually putting something in your pocket. If a burglar breaks into somebody's house and all of a sudden they realize that the that the that the homeowner's home and the homeowner's coming down the stairs and the burglar leaves, then they could still prove that there was an intent that the burglar was going to steal. You don't have to actually put something in your pocket for there to be intent. It's it's just the intent of you wanting to steal something. And I'm not saying that Arbery was there to steal anything, but from what McMichael's being being around the corner and then Arbery fleeing, which then changes it, that all he has to have is a reasonable suspicion that he had committed a felony. Once a person is fleeing in the state of Georgia from what is a, 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 a lawful citizen's arrest, the person claiming that only needs reasonable suspicion. They don't have to actually see a burglar uh something being stolen now i'm not well, defending the, it, the sorry go ahead i was gonna say as as it always is the case there's only one person whose side gets to be heard because the other person's in the ground i, so he I agree you know, so exactly we only, we only get one side of the story so we, we don't, don't know, know if he was even attempting i mean it was the, it was an under construction building who the hell so what's he going to do steal some nails well, no, you, there's a lot of people who go into construction buildings to steal the tools. The construction tools are, are worth a lot of money. I don't now, know. Okay, sure. That, but that's that's ridiculous. He wasn't running with the power tool. He obviously he, he didn't wasn't. have anything he, that was he, over he $500. Didn't, so there's he, he, no didn't, he didn't even balance. steal. He didn't even steal anything. But you, it, I'm saying again, the intent. It, you don't have to even actually take anything. I mean, you can oh, look no, and sure. there's, no, there's, I a, get you there's there. a bobcat caterpillar right there i mean that machine's worth thousands of dollars there's a boat but in that's there. not a felony you can't pursue for that on simple simple exactly. fact it wasn't but, a felony but, they weren't allowed to pursue there, it and there only has to be intent been, mcmichael doesn't matter mcmichael didn't have the legal right to do that he lost it when did so he lose he shouldn't it? have been doing it when when he lost he it last it? year hold on yeah hold he, but he didn't lose his citizen's right to conduct an arrest he lost no yeah no yes he right. did yes he did so, so, so the father lost his right to be to c conduct a citizen's arrest. Oh. Yes, yes, he did. But he's uh, not the one that was doing it. Sue and, someone and, with guns. Uh, but uh, under Georgia, uh, under yeah, I agree. We, we can talk about the them being vigilantes and and them being overzealous, you know, gun-toting people. But in the state of Georgia, there is no concealed carry, so they literally have to carry mm -hmm. with their guns showing. Mm -hmm. So, to to claim that. You know, they might be gun toting, zealous, whatever, but under Georgia state law, what they were doing was they were abiding by the law. So it so it, it, his uh, oh. his certification was suspended in uh, February 2019 after repeated failures to complete training. His his, his um, certification for what? To, to to be a police officer. You don't lose your right to be to conduct a citizen's arrest. That's a whole point. You're a citizen. You're allowed to conduct an arrest. And even and even if so, it, it was the son that was that was supposedly. No, you're right. It was his law enforcement certification. Yeah. And power to and power to arrest. So he he's no longer an officer at all. What's... Yeah. But but, but the whole thing is that it was the son. It was Travis was the one who who shot him. I don't think the, yeah, the son. No, was, you're right was... about you're right about that. He, the son was the one that shot him. But the whole entire point is why were we up to this point? What, yeah. what was the there's no, there was no right to pursue because there, there was no chance of a felony. The, the, I mean, you, you can't say there was no intent because he didn't take anything. Though. I didn't say no intent. Intent isn't a felony. It, it literally says it right here. First degree burglary is a felony with illegal entry with the intent to, to com commit a theft. 
I mean, that's literally what the law of Georgia says. And I mean, th these neighbors, these these people in the neighborhood were all worried because two neighbors of Scintilla Shores had firearms stolen out of the back of their truck. And there was another uh, complaint of another break in and entry. Now, I'm not so saying I, read, I read just today that there was no no robberies within the last or uh, no, no reported robberies, robberies within no the last robbery. two months. Nothing. Within the last two months. That doesn't make a difference that because somebody's gun might have been stolen in January for February that people aren't. I mean, if I get my chainsaw stolen out of my truck three months ago, that's not means I'm not going to be pissed three months later looking around for somebody. It, who's gonna but that doesn't mean it was that guy. I'm not saying yeah. it was that guy. I'm not it claiming that. Less I'm not to be claiming that, that Arbery so it was her life was him. that. This is BS. I see, I, see, I see where you. I see where you're coming from based on the law. So I, I, I will. I will concede the law point. My my point that I'm trying to make is, all too often when we're dealing, especially with persons of color, things escalate. You know, my, minor crimes do not mean a death sentence. I agree. This to me does not equate to a death sentence, and I think. I, I personally do not agree with the whole concept of citizen's arrest. That's why we have police. That's why we have sheriff deputies. Citizens should not feel that they need to take it unto themselves to go and arrest some person or ask somebody what they're doing. That's why we, that's why we have police. The this, this situation never should have happened. This young man should not be dead because people need to mind their business, call the police, report it, and let the police do their job. Don't go in your truck and go and get a high off adrenaline and go get your shotgun and go looking for trouble. You don't go in your truck and pour somebody with your shotgun unless you're looking for a fight, unless you're prepared for it to escalate. I'm just tired of seeing things escalate right. to the point of death because- Shotgun and you know, pistol. You know, yep. and- it, two and seven Magnum. I've, I've seen so many situations throughout the country on, on things that did not escalate to death. I've seen gentlemen that were not of color that are wielding knives and axes at police officers and the police officers show restraint. I see, I see people, you know, that have had weapons that are still de-escalated. De but then when we have persons of color who are committing a minor crime or are even unarmed, they're dead. They don't have a chance to have their day in court. That's my point. They don't get the chance to have their day in court. They don't have the chance to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. That I mean, right there, there, there are stories of, of white people getting shot that don't have guns. I mean, I have them right I here. Now. That, Alabama, 50-year-old guy yeah, was shot because he was charging minority, at a, my friend. He was, he was charging at a guy with minority. a spoon. And I'm just, I'm just trying, but I'm going with the percentages. I'm just, I'm going, I'm going by the vast majority of cases. The, the percentages in, in, in 2017, the, the police killed 19 unarmed black people. So we don't need to come out here and say that police are going around killing unarmed black people all the time. It's it's not a very they fair it, narrative. To it. We, we have we have tape officers. recordings of cops say, saying it. There is the there's camera. racist cops. I, I totally agree. There's racist cops and they're they're P POSs. I, I, they're garbage. But to to blanket the vast majority of police officers as as racist doesn't help the problem at all. It's it's not the officers. It's, it's not the, the system officers. they work it's, in. Exactly. The system is entrenched. It, 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 we, we, we are a country founded on, on the backs of, of, of slaves, period. And, and if you build a society that way, we're still just coming out of that uh -huh. disgusting infancy. We, we, we have to face the problems that come oh. from a life, a, a world built on slavery and, and the ramifications of an entire culture treated that way. That's what this is. We have a bunch of white people who've we're talking been about, trained. We're talking about 2020, who we just had a black president for eight years and we have Muslims in Congress. That I mean, doesn't make yeah, it Yeah, we've made good steps. It, it, we it, are not it, there. It, it's not over. We, yeah. So we, if we're going to say that the system is racist, we have to show some kind of statistic that shows that the system is systemically racist. We can't just I, I, throw blanket I, statements. We have uh, obvious. We can we can look at we have plenty it's, of steps. Yeah. No, no, please no, jump in on jump in on this, Hannah. Well, I just think it's blatantly obvious that our country is incredibly racist on on the well, baseline. You, you'll you'll have to give me some kind of, of proof then. Just it's obvious well, racist. For you, this, you, you... for Ahmad's case, is that uh -huh. he? So he goes and peeps in a house, checks it mm -hmm. out, see oh this place is getting built. I've done that personally. I've checked in on, oh, this place is being built. Oh, it looks like. Yes, anybody could have said that I had intent to steal something. However, broad daylight, if I was wearing a, sh a white shirt like him, not at all covered up or looking suspicious other than just being at a place that he wouldn't, is not supposed to be. 
checking in on something like that and then continuing on a run in a neighborhood that your family lives in and you regularly ten, No, she lives in. 10 miles away. Her, her mom's house is 10 miles away, so they don't live in that. I heard it was house. near his, his parents. He was, he was 10 miles away from his parents' house. Did he run that? Did he come from I, I somewhere he, that was he, reasonable? He, he supposedly jogged it. But yeah, that's a hell of a, but, I mean, so he the was a runner. The background on who this guy is, is that he is a runner. That's what everybody says about him is that's his love. So if-, if uh, I'm not gonna bring up his here. credibility. I mean, he, he brought a, a gun to a basketball game. So, but I'm not gonna uh, sit here and say that he was a criminal that had- So we're talking about that. But, but- but my point is, is what that-, was that time? It, I mean, he, we always bring up people's past instead of what was going on right then. Was he bringing a gun? Uh, no, that, I'm, that I'm not saying that, but if we're bringing up somebody's character. I, I'm bringing up what actually happened. He peeped in a place and then continued on a run at a place that was familiar in. enough to go running. Uh -huh. He didn't have things on him that were intending to steal or any kind of armament. He's being his normal self person. When you do background check on who he is as a person, him running in a neighborhood is not an odd thing. Okay. There's just... If you switch out his color of skin, nobody. You're just, but, but see, you're just saying that, and you haven't given me any evidence that the system is racist. You're only showing me that Ahmad Arbery's case is that the whole system is racist. You're going to have to give me more evidence, and this little one case shows how America and the system and the police system as a whole is racist. We can't just say, look at this guy, and if we change his skin color, then he wouldn't be dead. That is how the system is racist, because that's not enough evidence to just say that America is racist. There's been a there's been a long history of police brutality to African Americans and yeah. citizens to African Americans based on their skin color. But we're talking about more. 2020. We're talking about 2020, where as I said, 2017, police killed 19 unarmed black people. I mean, so but you just said we're talking about 2020. You bring up 2017. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, 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 so I'm talking about three years ago. Do you want do you want to get the statistic of, 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 of this year? I'm giving you the statistic because that's the closest one I have. If you want to give me 2018 or 2019 but, statistic, it's not going to be farther just, off okay. from 19 blacks killed. You're saying, you're, but using what you're saying, you're just saying mm -hmm. that a certain amount of people have been shot by the police, correct? Yeah. All right. Yes. But that doesn't mean that numerous people weren't brutalized or... They, oh, you, right. you, but, but, but I, I could give I, I could guys, say that about I, I, I race mean, as well too. Guys, guys, guys! I'd like to interject real quick. I want to get the uh, legal opinion here from uh, Amanda. You've been you've been AFK for a little bit. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Ahmad Arbery case? You're currently um, muted. When you're unmuted. <laughs> Amanda, unmute you're muted. Please unmute yourself. There you I'm go. sorry, I'm muted. I'm hey. so sorry. There, there she is. I uh, I had an emergency that I had to deal with. Yeah, welcome um, back. So which aspect of the Ahmad Arbery case would you like uh, me to give uh, a legal analysis of? So I guess how much of the conversation up to now have you seen? We've been on this topic for about 15 minutes now, I would say. I saw the very last little bit with Hannah and Tyler and Robert. The Got very it. last little bit. That is pretty much where we left off. So um, just in terms of racism in the system or racism in this particular case? Well, let, let's, let's go back to the beginning. Um, so... Um, with the, you know, and one of the questions that I asked Kylan was, um, what do you say to um, the critics who say like the law was correctly applied in, in this case? Um, when you say that was the law correctly applied, are you talking about the decision not the, to arrest initially? No, no, the, the ability of citizens to go and make a citizen's arrest. So I think that very much depends on what the citizen's arrest statute says. I've read some places that for Georgia, they have to actually witness a felony being committed. So for example, if I walk up and see somebody dead on the ground and somebody else standing over them with a smoking gun, I can arrest that person. Um, but if it's just speculation, if they don't actually see a felony committed they can't actually effectuate a citizen's arrest in georgia well they, um, they can't they can if if the if the perpetrator has started to run which well, means that all, all they need is a reasonable suspicion to be able to conduct their citizen's arrest that's what georgia law says thank you robert but in terms of what they actually saw what from what everything I've read, from everything I've read, this was a, a completely open construction site. There were no signs saying you couldn't be there. There were uh, 
no it's a fences. dwelling. It's a dwelling. Oh, it's somewhere where people I'm live. But no, it is, no, it, no one lived there. It, no you don't have to have some. There. You don't have to have someone live there for it to be considered a dwelling. Hold, hold on there. So it it very much depends on the condition of the home. So, for example, if my home is completely empty because I'm going to sell it, it's still considered a dwelling. Um, but if it's completely just gutted, it's not necessarily a dwelling. So there's that issue. But in terms of this particular location, um, there are supposedly witnesses out there who have come forward saying, you know, the McMichaels, they would walk through this construction site. Other people in the neighborhood, people who happened to be white, would walk through the construction site, essentially do the same thing that Ahmad Arbery is seen on the video doing, just going in, looking around, two minutes later, leaving. Um, I think it also, in terms of if we're going to talk about while well, he's running, um, how is he running? He's not sprinting away, he's jogging away. Um, this is clearly someone who's not trying to flee the scene of a crime because if you're fleeing the scene of a crime, that assumes you know you have committed a crime um, or you know that police have been called. Um, there's no evidence to suggest that he knew somebody saw him. Yeah, or there, there is. You can watch the video and some guy yells at him and that's when he starts running. You have to watch well, you, the video of him out in front. You can't hear anything in the video, so I don't think we can say that somebody yelled at him. Um, but there, there, there is testimony that that guy who had came out of his house had yelled at him and that's when he had started running. Okay. Well, I, at the end of the day, the McMichaels didn't witness that, right? They didn't witness him running. They didn't witness him. They did. Out of if house. you listen to the phone call that Travis had made, he says, and now he's running. No, no, no. Hold up. He did not see him run from the house. They, what I have looked at is they're talking about him running after the fact. They don't see him go in the house, leave. They and do. They, they do. They, they have that. The, here, I have it quoted right here. Travis in the call that there's a guy in the house right now. And they but say through the. So yes. He was told about it. Somebody told him. And that's the difference with a citizen's arrest law. You have to be the person who sees it. And even then being in the house is not enough. It still but, has to but, be for a felony. But once somebody is fleeing, all you need is reasonable suspicion if they believe that the person has committed a felony. But it's if it's just trespassing, that's not reasonable suspicion but, but, of felony burglary. But that, but it's only. The but they they believe that there was an intent to to commit a first degree burglary. Whether they believe it or not is irrelevant. Did they have articulable it, facts to believe that? Because you can be on someone's well, land, even in a in a structure, and not have the intent to steal. But um, you can also have. But you can also have way, the intent to steal. Also, yeah, but that's you know. If there isn't facts that you can articulate and point to and say, well, I know he was intending to steal because he had a backpack and it appeared to be empty. Or you don't have to blood. know that for sure. I you don't, you don't need have a reasonable sure, suspicion. You have to look at the circumstances to be able to point to facts that say, um, okay, this person has this intent because of these facts. And just well, presence enough is is not uh, presence alone is not typically enough. Well, um, so the, the other thing is. The, so apparently the, the apparently the law felt that whatever reason they gave wasn't good enough because they are in custody and they're being they're going to be charged. Well, and, and that's, yeah, that's another thing. So I the officers who yeah. the arresting officers who were on or not the arresting officers, but the officers who initially responded to the shooting, um, they spoke to I think city or county commissioners and they said we had probable cause to arrest them meaning they didn't believe that these gentlemen were effectuating a legal citizen's arrest at a higher standard than, than reasonable suspicion. And they wanted to make that arrest. They were ready to make that arrest. And the prosecutor yeah. told them not to. Um, yeah, the true. prosecutor who ha you know, is friends with this gentleman who worked with him for like 30 or 40 years told them not to. Um, so I don't think that they're going to be able to have you know, a good defense if the defense is we were just effectuating a citizen's arrest. Um, well, I, I think there's also the fact that the father had also had a run in with uh, Ahmad Arbery with a ch charging of some kind of case that, that had happened prior. So, so, there, there's, so there, there's no proof that they knew each other at that point. Yeah, he probably and, worked on that case, but he, they, we don't know if they did. knew. And it was many years ago. I think it was when he was in high school or something and it was shoplifting. Um, and so it mm -hmm. wasn't something where he knew this person recognized him. You know, if that were the case, they would have said that on their 911 calls. Hey, I know this person. This is his name, or I recognize him as somebody who I've investigated in the past. Well, we, we can't leave that out. They did. They also didn't. 
I think the other thing we need to keep in mind also and um, is the fact that Gregory Rick Michael had a problem with skipping use of force trainings when he was a law enforcement officer. Um, you know, it, I think they said it uh, in the article that I read, you know, between the years of 2005 and 2010, he didn't complete training um, for use of force and actually was stripped of his uh, legal ability to even arrest anybody in 2019, just before his retirement, because he wasn't going to training. And, you know, I think that creates a, a question of what kind of judgment he exercises when he wants to enforce the law. And I think that's going to end up being an instrumental part of any trial in terms of impeaching his credibility if, uh, if he chooses to testify. Great point, guys. Great conversation here. Um, out of curiosity, just because I don't know, um, has there been a trial date set or, or anything like that? Is Oh, no, 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 no. So the no. way, um, <laughs> so the courts are closed in Georgia right now until I believe mid-June. Oh, well, yeah, under, yeah. Georgia, under Georgia law, they still have to do the grand jury indictment process. So there still is a possibility that these guys walk away with no charges or lesser charges. Um, they still have to present evidence uh, rising to the level of probable cause to the community in a grand jury proceeding. After that, they will start negotiations, trial settlement conferences, setting trial dates. So we have a long way to go before that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Good conversation, guys. Really cool. Um, does anybody else want to get in on this uh, topic before we move on to uh, our next topic? I was going to bring up uh, Breonna Taylor and how that ties into um, the police force as well as the general incompetence in that particular case that led to an unfortunate death. Mm -hmm. So for, for those uh, who aren't familiar with the case, uh, can we just get a quick synopsis on that for the audience or? I can do that. Thank Go you. For it. Go for it, okay. Yeah. So Brianna Taylor was an EMT. She was sleeping in the same bed as her boyfriend. Um, and basically there was a warrant to search her re that residence. Um, there's some dispute as to whether or not that warrant was actually for that residence or if they had the wrong apartment. Um, they were investigating somebody who was suspected of selling drugs and possibly sending drugs to the apartment that was gonna be searched. Um, so they executed a no-knock warrant which is basically where they just bust in, bust in the door in the middle of the night, raid your apartment, raid your house. Um, the police are disputing that it was a no-knock warrant, but her boyfriend called 911 believing there was an intruder uh, and neighbors say they never heard anybody knock and announce saying, hey, we're the police, we're here. Um, her boyfriend uh, allegedly fired a shot at an officer hitting him in the leg and the officers allegedly fired back, hitting Brianna Taylor eight times while she slept and she was killed. Um, there are now some facts coming out that um, there were officers shooting from outside of the apartment uh, as well as inside of the apartment. Um, bullets were found in nearby apartments and there is a possibility that the officer was actually hit by friendly fire. Um, her boyfriend has now been charged with attempted murder. And of course the best and most ironic fact is the person they were looking for was in custody at the time and didn't live there which is why people are wow. saying they had the wrong house. So those are the so, basic facts. I, I knew very little about that case. So thank you for that uh, synopsis. Um, does anyone want to jump in on, on this topic? Well, this is also a stand, this is a stand your ground state. And um, Breonna Taylor's boyfriend weapon was legally owned. He was legally obliged to be able to carry it, called the police because he thought that he was in danger, was standing his ground protecting his home, and the love of his life got killed and he's being charged with attempted murder for protecting his house. Uh, it, it defies me how no, no knock raids are still legal. Um, I just think they're total horseshit because what, what reasonable person, it's, it's past midnight, it's dark, you're in your bed, you think someone's breaking into your house, you call the police saying that you think somebody's breaking in your house and you feel that you're in imminent danger. So you get your legally obtained firearm to protect yourself and it just so happened to be cops who made a mistake, who were at the wrong place, killed your girlfriend, and now you're on trial for murder. What reasonable person would know that they're police when it's no knock, where they did not announce who they were, where they just bust right in? What is the reasonable person to do? 
in that situation, if not stand your ground. No, nope, but there's no culpability for the police once again. Another, once again, someone is dead who didn't do anything wrong. You know, it, it never fails. And more than, more than likely, these cops are gonna walk. Well, I am encouraged that um, Governor Kemp is calling for an investigation. Of, or I'm sorry, not Governor Kemp, the governor of Kentucky, Bashir. I'm sorry. Um, got my states mixed up from the last case. Uh, is calling for an investigation. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, so I want to know what Robert has to think about it, because I know he wanted to talk about this case. The resident conservative. Uh, I, Go for it. I, I, I don't necessarily know if I wanted to talk about the case more or less as, as um, no-knock warrants. Um, I, I think that I would have to uh, agree with you guys on, uh, I don't agree with no-knock warrants. I think that they're unconstitutional and um, their most excuses for them is, is that they don't want the criminals to flush the drugs down the toilet. Uh, I think it's garbage. I mean, uh, from a libertarian aspect is where I stand. I, I don't think that anybody should be criminally charged for the drugs that they use inside their home. Um, and I, I, I don't agree with uh, no-knock warrants. I, th I think that they cre create a imminent danger to homeowners and the police officers. I mean, you know, the, that is their job. Um, you know, they're not the ones who are... Uh, issuing the warrants, um, but I 100% disagree with them and I don't think it does any good for the, for the community for, for no-knock warrants. And I, I think I just wanted to add my, my right-wing libertarianism yeah. into the, <laughs> to it. And, and unfortunately, Brianna Taylor is not the only person who has been killed, injured, or maimed by these types of raids. Um, there was a little boy, a toddler, um, his name, I can't say the whole name because it's very long, and um, but he goes by Boo Boo, and he was in his crib, and the officers threw a flash bang grenade into the room while the lights were off, and it landed in his crib, and he ended up with extremely serious injuries, and the officer who uh, wrote the warrant got um, false information from an informant. She was charged for presenting that false information, and she was found not guilty at trial. Um, their officers are usually not held accountable for mistakes in warrants under what's called the good faith exception to the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. The theory being, you know, if the officer themselves believes the information that they're given, then that's fine. They don't need to do any extra digging. You know, if somebody gives them the wrong address, that's not on them. Um, and so the law excuses that. Um, and, you know, hopefully something changes because it is a situation where people are going to react naturally and usually that's going to result in somebody getting hurt or killed gotcha well said thanks guys uh, appreciate the input on that one uh, i want to go um to let's go to tyler next you haven't spoken in a while what do you have to say about this one it's this, I don't mean to put whole, you on the spot, but <laughs> well, no, because it, it's 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 that this this whole entire case is one of my worst nightmares. I literally have had dreams even recently where I'm in my bedroom and the police knock down my door, and I have no what reason. I don't know why they're there, and I get my face kicked in and I can only imagine the fear that they were feel, feeling at the time um, that they thought somebody was breaking in the door and then all of a sudden you have uh, a couple a couple of police officers coming in guns blazing um, I it, it just hurts it, it hurts it, I, I I don't know the the emotion that I can I can I can em emote right now. I, I'm almost speechless. Um, so yeah, when when you ask me to speak up, I just don't know how to feel that we are still dealing with this and 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 
still hearing about people being shot in their house, um, shot because a police officer went to the wrong house or shot because they got off a bus, shot because they're sitting on a street corner, shot because they're in the wrong neighborhood. I, coming from where I come from and hearing some of the stories of my my parents growing up, my, my grandmother growing up, you could just be on the wrong side of the railroad tracks and just because you're there, you get taken out. Um, I've, I've had the police chastise me just because I'm in the wrong area or I'm driving erratically even though I'm following the cars in front of me and um, going the speed limit following all the laws around me. And I, in those situations, when the, the situation I'm, I'm thinking of personally is I was driving down the road about 10, 11 o'clock at night, coming back from dinner, um, going toward home, got pulled over by one cop, um, asked me that it, why was I driving in the bike lane when there's not really a bike lane on the right side of the lane. And within five minutes, there was five police cars behind me uh, just because uh, I guess they were bored or something. And sitting there and, and feeling like I was surrounded and that if, if I say something wrong, I'm going to have a problem. And I, I again, I don't know how I... I I don't know how we fix it. We need to do something to fix this. And so we don't have the systematic racism that Robert seems to not think happens, uh, that other people in this country seem to not think that happens. But as a I, I never, of color, I, I, I never said that, that racism doesn't happen. I said that is not on a systemic level that all blacks are being treated differently. I, I, but I'm not saying that it's all blacks. I'm just saying from my personal experience, from Kylan's personal experience, we have felt those feelings. We've felt like we've been in those positions. And I, I mean, I, with Ahmad, I mean, I'm sorry to go back to that. With Ahmad, I, I, if somebody was chasing after me and they were, throwing racist epithets or whatever they were yelling at him and I had a gun pointed at me I don't know what I would do I would probably do the same thing unfortunately that ended badly for him and I, I in these cases the fact that people walk away from that even though there's it's clear that there is a problem there's no justice for those people Powerful stuff, Tyler. Thank you for sharing. I, I don't, that didn't sound like it was easy. So I, I, I appreciate you uh, you pouring your heart out, man. Seriously. Um, let's go. Hey, Charles or Jules, do either of you want to get in on this? Or? Well, I, I just had yeah. something to say about um, the systemic racism. We'll issue. get to you next, Charles. Um, because there is quite a bit, bit of statistical evidence that supports that that is actually indeed a thing. Um, so I'm looking at statistics. Um, there's a, in the book, uh, Suspect Citizens, Frank L. Frank R. Baumgartner and Derek G. F. Uh, reviewed 20 million traffic stops. Um, blacks are almost twice as likely to be pulled over as whites, even though whites drive more on average. Uh, blacks are more likely to be searched following a stop. Just by getting in a car, a black driver has about twice the odds of being pulled over and about four times the odds of being searched. They found that blacks were more likely to be searched despite the fact that they're less likely to be found with contraband as a result of those searches. Um, a 2013 Justice Department study found that black and Latino drivers are more likely to be searched once they have been pulled over. Uh, about 2% of white motorists were searched versus 6% of black drivers and 7% of Latinos. Um, and this goes on and on and on. There's a pretty significant amount of evidence that demonstrates that, that doesn't really demonstrate that just demonstrates that police were wanting to search a vehicle that doesn't show i mean it you're demonstrates not giving, that the that, comp contraband was found more likely in white people's cars but they okay. search black people's cars more often um 
so that that shows how how a system is racist because it that because shows they that just, there's just... a there's more suspicion from police officers onto black or latino drivers than there is on white drivers even though there's less likely to be a crime even but, though but, there uh, are less uh, black you're, drivers you're, on the road you're, you're leaving out the fact that that when you look at it minorities commit crime on a higher level than white people do so just i'm not sure that's true at all no, no, i think that's I, entirely I, 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 I have it right here blacks commit homicide at eight times the rates of whites and hispanics that was a study that's, that was done. a socioeconomic that aspect to that as well that, that, that's uh, this is violent crime we're talking about we're not just I agree. talking and think about how many people are not charged with violent crimes because murder so well tell me, tell me how many life. white people are not yeah, charged like with murder. Yeah, like McMichael for two months. Are you he's, kidding, he's, dude? He's charged. He's charged with murder. Now, yeah, now that the video yes. is public, after uh, uh, so you got one across the world. Uh, uh, okay, so months. you have you have one person that that was not charged with murder. I mean, I mean, how many how many people he's do you think that example. are out? You said how many me how many people how many white people do you think are out there that commit murder that aren't in jail or aren't being charged with it right many. now? Many, probably a lot. Many. That, I think that's garbage, I, and you would have to show some kind of evidence that supports that. You, well, you can't, you can't you have can't, the evidence if they're getting away with it and nobody knows it, about it. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's just, it's just, just your assumption. It's just charged. your assumption that 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 white people are all walking around committing murder and they're not going to jail for it in 2020. There I mean, are I mean, we, have, we have cell phones. We have videos. I mean, we have a whole bunch of evidence that that could put somebody in jail. There's there's no suggestion that a whole bunch of white people are walking around that have committed violent here's, crime. Here's the so, other thing you need to consider. Uh -huh. There are a lot of people convicted of murder and violent crimes, the majority of which are people of color, who end up getting exonerated. Due to people get convicted because of misidentification, because of uh, stereotypes, because they had an all white so, jury so, in the so, South. So, so, Those are things you need to consider. So, if it was a misidentification, then it and, and they say it was a, like a, a, a Latino suspect, right? And then so that person was wrong. It still doesn't change the fact that it was a, a Latino suspect. I mean, I mean, to, to I can go over the statistics uh, here. I mean, not, here we, we have we have Robert. What? Um, I said not necessarily. Um, it could very well be another Latino. It could very well be a white person that ended up being the suspect there. The the. Point but but is, we, we, we don't we don't have evidence that you guys are claiming this. I mean, just just to say that because you hear about one story of how a, a, a white person got let off the hook, that that means that they're they're not being charged with committing crimes. I mean, we, we have to go off more than feelings when we're talking about subjects like this, because there's so a, when, be when you say that, but when you say that, when you say that, though, and we keep hearing stories every other month yes because years. the media wants to perpetuate no, it's that. not it doesn't matter about that i, I mean i mean do you, hear, do you hear the story let about Tyler the speak. okay if we keep hearing stories about it and there's a continual pattern of evidence when we have people being beaten down in the street and on videotape and we have people that get exonerated for that even though there like is who? evidence like who? even when there is evidence like who uh, it was Amanda, help me on this one. Uh, the guy in LA, there was Rodney. Uh, Rodney King. Rodney King. Rod in the yeah, Rodney 90s. King. I'm, I'm, but I'm giving you an example of long history of this. They choked off. And, and people get off. Tyler, like, finish we, your point. Yeah, and then I want to get to uh, Charles real quick and then back to uh, Robert. Yeah, I, so, I agreed. There's all I'm saying is, all, it's not it's not just one case; it's multiple cases over time. And so we can't say we, we took one case and we heard one thing when we've heard it for years and years and years. Yeah, but who, ahead, who, ahead, who's gonna who's gonna report the story about a, a, a white guy chasing a cop with a spoon and he gets shot and killed, or about the white white twenty eight year old that's erratically driving and is walking fast towards a police officer in Alabama and gets shot? What kind no, of story? So that, what, set, no, that and, and, they're, and they're not. Not. and they're not they're so then we get this yeah. we get this scare that it's, it's a whole bunch of cops killing black people for for no reason because they're not the media is not putting the stories out there that there happens to be unjustified kills just, of white people too it's not just about what the media is putting out there it's what we have in terms of statistics and I, statistically I, you, you native haven't american given, you haven't and given black folks are 
are experiencing police brutality at much higher weight rates than white folks. If you look at it, just break down the demographics. And I know we wanted to get Charles in, so I'll shut yeah, up. Let's get him in. Yeah, go ahead, Charles. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. See, I have experience from the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, and the 90s, the 2000s, and the teens of harassment because of the color of my skin. In California, in Kentucky, in Texas, where I was living, but I was traveling. What you doing here, boy? I'm 40 years old. How the hell are you going to call me a boy? You don't tell me that's not racist? And it happens more so I'm than any time I've ever been around. See, see you're, you're saying that there's no, no racist uh, actions in the police. Uh, I'm not saying I'm not I'm not lie. saying that there's no racism from the police. There sure are racist police out there, and I, I'd make an argument that the guy who freaking killed Philando Castile probably had some racially biased and probably had some kind of you know stupid racial motive in his head that made him think that the black guy was pulling the gun. So I'm not going to say that there are no racist cops out there. I'm staying on a systemic <laughs> level. That, that, For that. those of you who uh, don't know, Philander Castillo was one of the more egregious uh, cases of uh, systemic racism in the police Minnesota. force that I'd ever seen. Was that the Let Me Breathe one? No. No, no that, was, that was, um, was in Minnesota. And he was a yeah, lawful gun over. He was pulled over for a ticket. He told the officer, hey, by the way, I have a gun on me. He was told to get his permit. And when he reached for his, his concealed carry permit, the officer thought he was reaching for the gun and shot him in front of his girlfriend and uh, their child. And he bled oh. to death. And, and it was officer, live streamed. The officer, as, the as officer was found not guilty. Yeah. Yes. So, but, I mean, I, know, I would say it's- what I was saying. Yeah, Charles, Go ahead, Charles, sorry. Charles, yep. Yeah. Yeah, my point is this. No matter what, if it's one police that's crooked, the whole system is crooked because if you're not gonna turn them in, Yeah. Mm -hmm. one, one bad apple spoils the bunch. Your whole, your, right. One bad will destroy everything because just like me and my job, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to police them just like they're supposed to police me. I can't tell them what to do, but I, I need to address them when they do something that's, that they're not supposed to do. Absolutely. So, you know, one bad person is always going to create the whole system to be bad. So if you're working with them, you know it. Yes. I, I, I'd have to say it's pretty dangerous to, to label the whole cops as, as being bad. It's the same notion of ACAB where all cops are bastards. I think it's really dangerous because what police are doing in 2020 is they're, they're data driven to, to do what they do. They go to, to, areas of high crime and, and that happens to be in minority communities and th they do this by data. They're not going out there and saying, I, I wanna go and ar arrest a black person or I wanna go out and shoot an unarmed black person. There's no data to support. Seems, it just seems to but, just keep happening. But in it just terms seems of what, what uh, makes only 19, only 19 of them happened in 2017 and the highest year was 2015. There was 35 un unarmed black people that were killed. So it's, yeah, I wish it was zero. Too many. It's, 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 I, amen to that. Amen to that. The point that. you're trying to make is but, but, you, you, can't, you can't discount everybody's experience, Robert. You can't say that just because we can't throw stats out of our ass in an instant that it's not happening. You can't you can't discount people's experiences from all across the country. You can't discount history. I, I'm, okay? I'm, I'm, you wanna, you I'm, I'm not discounting. I'm not discounting. I'm not discounting people's experiences, but 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 uh, but I'm I, 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 I no, but but I do believe that these that a lot of these experiences might just be in some people's heads. Like you know, like I, I've been I've been pulled over by the police. Oh, I'm crazy. Five, no, I'm not saying you're crazy. I, I totally understand. Yes, that's, that's that, what that's you're from, insinuating. No, I'm not because it I might understand be in my that, head. You're from, that, that you're from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. I understand that during those times, it was a lot different than we are in 2020 today. It's I not understand that, that. Not that different racism now. has not disappeared that's in between the 1980s and 2020. It has disappeared. It's hid. Hey guys, hold on one at a time. Let's go to Tyler. He had his hand raised. So. I, I, I have a, 
I'm looking at our website. It, it says last year in 2019, there were only 27 days in which the police did not kill someone. There was 1,099 people killed in 2019. Black people were 24% of those, despite being only 13% of the population. I I I, I have I have some much. This has oh, nothing to do Robert, with being we're... unarmed. It's the same thing since 2015 as well. I'm, Hold on, I'm Robert, just, you're uh, lagging again, bud. And and I'm just saying this is Dead from last year. Dead. And this has nothing to do with unarmed or armed, but this is just saying that 24% of the people that were killed by the police last year were black, even though we are less than 13% of the population. And, so and that that's means because we are, blacks we are commit three blacks. I, I understand they, they're three times more like, likely to, 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 be, to be killed by the police, but that's because Blacks commit more than 50% of all violent crime. Oh, Robert, what I want you to consider is bullshit. the fact that No, police... it's not bullshit. This is the DOJ well, statistics. You can't just call statistics right. bullshit. Hold on, but there are other factors to be considered. You don't live in my area. Factors, is selective enforcement. They are more likely to enforce right. certain laws in certain neighborhoods. And when that happens, the crime rate goes up for those neighborhoods. You don't hear about all these rich people getting arrested for drugs. I have been in- you're, you're, We're I talking about violent been, crime. You don't hear about all these rich people going on, around killing on. people. I'm, well, we're not just talking about killing people. Hold up. I'm, because, we're talking about, up. yes, he was just talking hold about up. violent crime. Wait, Rob, you're talking about people Rob, getting shot. Rob, what puts people in the position to be encountered by law enforcement? The presence of law enforcement. Uh -huh. What's, what increases the presence of law enforcement? The crime, crime. rates. But Fine. these go hand in hand, exactly. right? Because here's the thing, here's the thing. If they are not enforcing at the same level in a rich neighborhood or a well-off neighborhood, the crime rates for those neighborhoods are gonna be low, even if the crimes in reality are actually still being committed at the same rate or at a higher rate. Where are all these, where are all these murders happening in, in white We're suburban not areas? Talking about murders. We're not just talking about well, murder. We're, We're talking well, about all crime. We're talking about all crime at all levels because uh, and, and all crime, crime when go you go up, through the when crime rates go up because of the presence of the police, more police are put into those neighborhoods. And, and let's go through the FBI crime statistics. We can go through the crime statistics and we look at rape. That is usually a, a, a white thing that happens. I mean, we can go through the certain kind of crimes. That's a, that's a, that's a human thing. Murders and rapes are not are not that's what are filling. Murders and rapes are not filling up our prisons. Okay, low no, level no. drug and property crimes are. Or yeah, but 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 but, we're, 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 that, but that now now you're changing account. you're changing the subject. We're we're talking about violent crimes and 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 black people being murdered here and and being and being black racially being profiled. Murdered. Yes, but that's not because of violent crime. That yeah, they're they're, they're, no, they're, 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 they're for the most part. That's not what the, the, my point was. Stop and frisk. That's not for violent crime. Where's where's stop and frisk happening? Literally everywhere. No, I, it happens everywhere. It happens in every single community. You hear about it more in New York City because of, you know, the impact it had there, just like we hear more about New York City for the coronavirus because of the oh, impact and, it had there. It's the most populated city in our country. But and stop and crime go down? Everywhere. And when you have police arresting people more often for crimes or targeting communities for investigation or patrolling more, they're naturally gonna arrest more people, which will then compound to say, well, this has a higher crime rate, so we need more cops. Now it has a higher crime rate, so we need more cops. Those same things are not happening in rich communities or communities that don't have a lot of minority members living there. Because there's not a lot of crime happening in those neighborhoods. No. Yes, oh, police, police are, are, are going, they're using data. They're going and using data to find out where people are committing and crime the and they're patrolling their from? area. They are creating the data. It's effectively right. self-reported. So, so, so you're, you're, you're saying, so you're just saying that the people that are reporting the data are, are racist and that they're, That's they're what using. I said. So, I said so what are you, I'm, so, so I'm what are you saying about myself, the data? Robert. I'm trying to explain. Uh, okay. It's self-reported in terms of arrests, meaning the police are reporting who they're arresting. It's not something where they're saying, well, we're only arresting black people and that it's a racist thing in terms of you know, submitting the data. But my point is they are more likely to enforce the law 
and actually arrest people in poor communities and communities of color. Be because that, because fighting. there's more, because there's more oh, crime that no, is no, happening. No, no, in, in, no, no, yes, right. yes, yes, imagine, yes. Uh, you can't just say that. Imagine a situation where you have a rich white community and a black poor community or a Hispanic yeah, I, poor community. I, I, no, Amanda, yeah. Amanda okay. finish, finish your point real quick and then I want to jump over to Kylan and Lewis. Yeah, I will. Um, imagine that the same crimes are being committed. Just imagine. Okay. And police show up to investigate those crimes. They mm -hmm. let Susie Sunshine, the rich white housewife, go home when they pull over for her, pull her over for a DUI or catch her with drugs. What, 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 they drive her home. This they is don't a story her. that you're telling. This is no well, evidence. I'm you're just you making, an example. But you're giving These me, you, you can't just make up, you can't just make up an example like, oh, there's a I'm pink unicorn over an here. And, and there's, Rob, where, those cases cases, you can't just make up some story and, and, and just oh, Robert, to create a, a false Robert, dichotomy this this. no yes. you can't people you can't are less likely to get arrested for the same crimes in a rich neighborhood period oh okay well, let's the hold, hold on, hold on. Speak. let's let's, let's talk cut in here. hold on let, let me wait, talk wait. about that real yeah. quickly is is you have the same crime for smoking weed is that the kind of crime you're talking about where people get arrested more black people are getting arrested because they smoke weed than white people who smoke oh weed? don't get into that because then that is we an have entirely to... separate conversation oh, no, yeah. Wait, oh, people, oh, yeah, yeah. Those are situations where you can hear white person after white person say yeah the officer just drove me home hold up so, man i've had that happen um Anyways, so so Robert, it seems to be there's there's a disconnect with you. You're saying they're all very all the cops are data driven now, but yeah. if they're starting with a bad data set from the get go, then how are things not going to get your you know if if you start out with you know, a bad formula for creating all of these these stats and stuff like that, how is it not going to throw everything off? But, year but after year but after who's, year though. but who's claiming that you oh, guys yeah. are claiming well, the, the officers data are bad. Are, no no know? no because all the data hold on a second the data also comes from people making phone calls like i don't want these kids loitering on my corner oh, hang on he's dropping out there I'll Lagging again, bud. i don't feel <laughs> safe going outside of my house the the, the the problem is that these data sets aren't just coming from police officers these are also coming from people who make phone calls that yeah, they're so saying that they're that's reported are, are you to say that every single phone call like that is going to have a police report that we can actually track? Or is it going to be something that that led to, you know, a, an officer actually reporting it, whatever so the case happens to I be? I want to get in on the point of 911. Oh, 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 let, me, let me get in. Let me, oh, yeah. Sorry, Kylan. Kylan's been waiting. Yeah, let's get Kylan in. Make a point here. So, because we, we've had a nice little talk, talking about how Blacks commit all this crime and they commit violent crime. Let's talk about, let's talk about Christopher Ray. Let's talk about the director of the FBI um, testifying in Congress on what the greatest domestic danger is. The greatest danger to the people of the United States is white nationalistic domestic terrorism. That's from the FBI director. You want to talk about Black on Black crime and Black crime. You know what I worry about? You know where most of the violent crimes committed, where mass casualties are involved? White people shooting up schools. White people shooting up movie theaters. White people shooting up campaign events. Okay, let's let's, well, let's actually talk. actually actually I have the statistic. I have the statistic right here. Mass shootings. All the, all I, I, mass I, shootings. Hold on. No, you made Robert, your let him finish. Robert, let him finish. Let him finish. You did my time. You didn't have twenty minutes. All right. Who's committing? Who's committing the mass casualty events? Okay. All Blacks. of the worst. All of the worst domestic terror. I'm. Let me finish my point. All of the worst domestic terrorism events. Who have they been committed by? Okay. White people. Who who has the mo who who's the biggest danger? From the FBI, white nationalists. Okay, mm -hmm. who's who's who who marched in Charlottesville? It sure as hell wasn't my people. Okay, so let's call it both ways. Everybody, crime is crime. Don't tell me that black I, people I, are more in danger when all when all of the biggest mass casualty events are committed by white nationalists or people that sympathize with white nationalists. Okay, okay, who, okay. Goes shoot up, who shot up the movie theaters? Okay, who shot up the church? Okay, military base. Uh, okay, okay, so 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 so, so, so I, 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 I agree that there are racist white people out there, but when we go through the statistics of what a mass shooting, hold, hold on a second, right? and, and, and I condemn them. What haven't they shot up? I, Just I, tell me that. Answer me. What what haven't they shot up? You name a place. Who, who they shot up a church, Dylan Roof. They shot up an army base. You you guys love the vets. That's what they, they've been. They shot up the army base two or three times. 
You can't go to the okay, movies. Okay, and, and what about the- Can't go to a club. Can't go to a You can't go to a club? You mean the Muslim to, guy who shot yeah, up like freaking 40 people? And, no, I'm not talking about that guy. Okay, okay, so let me talk for a second. Well, I have the data you right here. let us talk. So that's the, well, let Kylan well, finish. Let Kylan finish. He just did point. finish. He just asked me a question. So can I respond right. now? Let, let Robert I mean, finish. You guys, guys just want to keep finish. bulldozing yeah. and keep talking. I just bring up a single point bulldozing and you guys want, and, and you guys just want to keep talking and hey, talking hey. and talking. Hold up, hold up guys. If, if, if you want to have a conversation, it's you say something and then you let somebody else say something. It's not, yeah. you just run a big, long sentence about for five minutes about your stuff. Okay. Hold when up, I Robert. talk, when I talk, I, when I talk, I bring up like a quick minute and I'm done with what I'm saying. I don't go on a well, five I mean, minute you understand because well you spend you spend all your time talking about the black crime rate well i want to just let you know that there's plenty of I, white crime I, out there. I, I i i agree with that and i just said whites are more likely to be rapists and more likely to be drunks i mean i can go through the statistics of what are whites are more likely to be on the statistics so i'm not going to sit here and and say mm -hmm. that black people are bad people that's not what i'm trying to say i'm going from the statistics and i'm reading you what the statistics say i'm going to tell you that white people are more likely to be rapists they're more likely to be drunks they're more likely to be plenty of other things from the fbi statistic so i'm not going to sit here and wag my finger and say black people are the problem with everything I'm, I'm i'm trying to tell you why there's a problem with with police brutality on what people think and and what happens so do, please don't try to paint me as just saying black people are bad but if we want to go through the statistics of, of of 2019 there were 72 mass shootings and what a mass shooting is it's four or more people being shot and in, in those statistics, 51% of those mass shootings were black people, 29% of those people were white, and 11% were Latino. So to say that white people are the only ones committing mass shootings is a very, is a fallacy and it's, and it's not accurate one bit. And I can go through the statistics as well from Mother Jones from 1982 to 2017. Blacks committed 16% of mass shootings, but like you guys said, they're only 12.5% of the population. Whites committed 54% of mass shootings, but they're what, something like 70% of the population. So let's not go out there and say that white people are the mass shooters because when I go from Mother Jones and now is Mother Jones a right-wing website? No, they're very far left. And, and this data goes from 1982 to 2017. So hey, don't Robert. come in and try to tell me that white people are the only ones committing mass shootings. Robert, I, I, hate to, I hate to interrupt you here. We need to get to the next point. So I wanna go to uh, Kylan and then Tyler, just give like quick closing statements on that point and then we'll move on to the next topic here. No, I'm, I'm good. I can go, I'm ready to go to the next topic. Okay. Yeah, let's go to the next topic. Uh, I am okay. too. Okay. All right. All right, let's Lewis. talk about the next right. one. Um, so this probably won't be as controversial here, but, um, I think we need a light one to kind of end the night anyways. Yeah. <laughs> uh, something we can all definitely agree on is that, uh, the coronavirus has definitely seriously hampered our supply lines, um, not just with basic essentials, but in just about every, every sense of the word. Um, and that kind of brings up, um, the food supply chain that we have and um you know the the current lack of food accessibility um food deserts everything like that is just um sorry it's uh you know just trying to make sure that everybody gets enough uh to eat and you know those the places that um are already affected uh, just, just from a normal standpoint. Um, Jake, did you want to jump in? Uh, so uh, just, just a couple basic statistics. Uh, that first wave of intense purchasing that we experienced that, that meant the shelves went completely dry, uh, that actually reflects a, a, a difference in spending in, in U.S., uh, how, how the population has been putting their money out for food. Before COVID, it was about 50-50. People spent their money uh, buying food for the house to cook and people spent their money going out for restaurants. As soon as COVID hit, that number switched to 90-10. People are spending about 10% of their funding going to restaurants or ordering dinner. So the stores had a, a panic moment of there's not they, their supply lines weren't prepared for it, but it's not that there weren't those supplies. They actually have a fairly fantastic and robust supply chain that is doing interesting things to handle it 
but it's designed to handle small failures. It's not so much a chain as a web. And if a few nodes of the web fail, the rest of it can can kind of you know bulk up and supply. But how close are we to like a, a more grandiose experience of failure? <laughs> Well, on, that, on that note, actually, um, and then Hannah, I'm sorry, I'll get to you. Um, does anybody know why originally um, there was a shortage of toilet paper? <laughs> like, I, I still don't have a good answer to that. Uh, I, like, after all this yeah. time, like, the only answer I have is, is that a bunch of people heard that toilet paper might be in short supply. And then well, a bunch it, of people. It wasn't bad, but it was I the lack of of warehouses supplying or like storing all of the extra the rolls and stuff like that because mm -hmm. it actually is quite expensive to ensure that warehouse since all of that is a fire hazard Oof. stored in one location yeah mm -hmm. boom so we have <laughs> we have two different types of large supply chains as they relate to food and and toilet paper is kind of pretty backed on this um there's the restaurant supply and then there's supermarket supply and with the supermarket supply, that's intended for in-home use, smaller quantities for the size of families. When it comes to the subject on toilet paper, supermarkets keep a certain amount of supply for that as expected on demand. But the, all the toilet paper that exists in our country that could have been gone out to people, there's a whole different group of it that's for bulk use, for restaurant supply, for larger corporations for schools, for things that are rolled in like things this big that would never go into our Tyler spaces. So there is, and that's the same situation for food is that we have resources, but they're allocated in sizing that is meant for larger facilities, larger groups of people, not shortened down into small packages for people, individuals to use. So yes, it exists. No, it doesn't exist in the size and scale that people actually want to purchase it in. And it's not immediately able to be, it's not easily able to be repackaged and sold on a whim like that for the normal family and people. It's a significant shift that we wanted very quickly that just can't roll over that quickly. And it never really occurred to me that that was an issue. Um, I, I did hear about that recently about how, you know, you know, restaurants and these bigger businesses, for example, they get eggs packaged a certain way that is completely different than you would get them packaged at a grocery store. And you can't easily switch that type of packaging to accommodate an egg shortage at, a, at you know, a grocery store versus a restaurant, if that kind of makes sense. They package them completely differently. They do, and it's costly to repackage, and it takes time to switch a significant service like that over. Food is the same situation. We've got a lot of food that's always reserved for restaurants. Of course, it's in value that's not exactly what individuals might want to purchase it in. Lots of people go for organic, and that's not necessarily what's being supplied to restaurant chains. So yeah, there's food, but do people want it in that variety? And it still has to get to them. So it's, we're already having supply issues with just transit, hauling, supplying the actual supermarkets with it, let alone those resources that were intended for restaurants that never had a track over to the supermarkets in the first place. Yeah. Um, what do you think can be done, about, or anybody who wants to chime in, um, think about what can be done for the fact that, you know, farms are now having to throw away substantial amounts of food um, and the fact that that food isn't going to like homeless shelters or to, um, you know, making meal packages for, um, you know, first responders. Why isn't it already? Well, I think it needs yeah. to be incentivized to do so because people are working with what their mm -hmm. pockets, what their what their bank accounts say that they can do. And if they're losing money by not being able to sell their resources in the first place, and it costs funds to get those resources to the proper places for people to consume them and, and take them for free, then they're having to put out just mm -hmm. to feed people. And although that would be awesome, mm -hmm. businesses don't do that. There, it needs to be incentivized. So, so Hannah, in your opinion, because you're speaking so, so elegantly on this, what 
what are some things that we can do either at the, at the state level or the federal level to provide incentives to to have these farmers take their their food supply to get it to people that are hungry what are some ways that are that are cost effective cost efficient or even if they're not what are some ways that we can directly impact the food supply well i heard about something that china was doing about resource allocation digitally so they have a system online that helps link farmers up with facilities and locations that will take their food and however that exchange is able to happen whether they're paid something for the able to travel to transit there or not there can be connections made between people that wouldn't normally have those connections available so there could be a system that we can incorporate to better facilitate the movement of these resources just kind of needs to happen needs to get started um, I know individuals that are personally taking it upon themselves to, to reach out to their community to obtain these types of resources and then reaching out to their community to find out who can we give this to. Like in their own hands, we're gonna do food sharing. And there's tons of corporate of uh, nonprofits that do this kind of work. But I think when we consider food, food has for a while turned to be something that we want to look at more locally. How can we grow it? How can we more within our close range home area be able to distribute food without having to transit it far? And this type of example is something that goes in line with that local food movement. Well said, well said. Um, does anybody else want to jump in on uh, this topic? Um, we're, uh, we're getting to 15 minutes to nine here, and uh, I think it's about time that we start wrapping up here, but uh, I want to get anyone's thoughts in. Anything that you guys have, uh, please jump in. I want to I wanna just talk more basically on, on, our, on our podcast, and I want to I start doing for me in positive you know, This has been a very substantive and a very, a very I wouldn't say chaotic, but a very energetic debate. Um, you know, but at the same time, as 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 hard, as as energetic and as biting as our commentary would be, I still think that it never crossed any lines. And so I just I wanted to commend everyone who taken part, who came with very strong takes. Um, you know, I know I did. Um, you know, and I think you know, I just I think this is good for us to continue to keep having these discussions and. And, and, and having the courage to have tough conversations that that can, that we know are going to be contentious and have strong feelings, um, but yet still have the courage to have them. And so I, I think that we we I think this is something that we should be be proud of. I, I know that I am. Um, I'm always going to continue to come strong and speak my mind. And I think we all should. Um, you know, I think I I, I appreciate uh, the commentary that Robert has provided. You know, I you know I think he took great pains to come with some statistics. Those statistics can be argued, but he took the time to research and, and to, to make points in, in a respectful manner. So I'll, I'll take that, um, and I appreciate that. And so you know, my thing is just let's just keep it up. Let's let's, let's be passionate, um, you know, and let's keep making good arguments. I, I think not just for us to learn more, but I think as we have a wider audience and more people are drawn into the fold. I think we can be a conduit to be able to voice what's on their mind and to be able to take ownership in their thoughts and think on a deeper level. And that's all that I got. Very good. Well said. Uh, uh, I think the podcast has been has been great for that too, to be able to share opposing opinions. Um, one thing I promised Robert that I'd do for this podcast is get him some uh, some backup. I didn't do that. I'm sorry, man. Uh, I failed you on that one, but uh, absolutely uh, sure. But I swear, mm -hmm. like it's coming next time. Um, we've got two people um, that we that we interviewed earlier in the week um, that are very interested in coming on the show on the 28th. So if you'll be back, um, you'll have uh, you'll have a little bit more uh, of uh, people that align closer to you. So if I'll be back, that shouldn't even be a question. <laughs> I just I, I just want to make sure we, we had some heat, we had some heated conversation in here, man. But uh, that's, that's, that's how that's it goes. The whole point we, of it. That's exactly, and, and it's yeah. never personal, and nope. um, you know, no harm, no foul. Exactly. Yeah, but you know, I mean, it always 
I always hate to see Robert get dogpiled on and stuff like that being the only <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm no, used to it living in Marin County. Piles. I get it, man. But you know, you know I feel bad. So I, I appreciate um, it. I, 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 I I'm no hard feelings with anybody, you know. I of course I appreciate I appreciate the debate uh, and I, I, I love you guys all the same as yeah. when I first met you guys. So girls as well. Excuse said, me. We're, all gonna, we're all gonna have we're all gonna have a steak dinner together one of these days. Exactly, a couple uh, beers. Yes, and as we get to go outside, put it on the grill. And, and, More than a couple for me, shit. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> if we have a barbecue, though, can we just say no politics for that one? Like, we've had a nope. yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, I mean, gathering nowadays. Yeah. All right. Um, does anybody else want to make a quick good. closing statement before we wrap this up? Or? Other than I guess we'll have to talk about the last topic next time. Think yeah, we're, we're coming up against nine <laughs> o'clock here. Uh, I, I told people that we'd hard stop at uh, two hours here. So I think that's that's enough for this podcast. But uh, I would like to say something. Yeah, Lewis, yeah. go ahead. Um, the conversation was definitely very spirited, very passionate. Um, Bob says hi to, to the whole stream, by the way. Yeah. Um, hey. Hi. Um, but yeah, it just, just making sure that, you know, one, everybody at the end of the day is we're still going to be friends. We're still going to be able to have that beer with them at the end. Um, yeah, it was, it was good to see that, that, uh, that back and forth there between you guys um, on, on a very, very personal topic there for you guys. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to commend Tyler uh, for sharing those experiences and those, uh, those fears that you have um, that that took a lot of courage to, to say that in front of everybody that is now on the internet for the rest of time yeah yeah never going away no. um, <laughs> and, to, and to charles too for sharing his experience yeah, yeah i was just about to say yeah. charles thank you for coming on i, yeah. I really really appreciated us, what you had to say i i thought you were a fantastic addition to our conversation yeah. today i love i love i'm glad you made it unk <laughs> yeah, yeah no you know i i just want to say robert I enjoy your conversation because we teach each other, you know, no harm, no foul, but yeah, you, you bring it just like you're supposed to. I like to see statistics, but I feel it from where I am. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't want you, anybody to think that I was dis, discrediting anybody's experiences, you know, I, your experiences oh, I, are what they are. And, and, no and, problem. And I don't think that they're fairy tales or they're lies, you know, I'd, I'd like to say that. I, I appreciate everybody's experiences and I don't want to diminish anybody from that. I, I can't no, we, think of a more too, man. I can't think of a more heartwarming way to end the podcast than that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of Project SIP's third podcast here. Thank you all for joining in. Really appreciate it. And to everyone in the comments who voiced their opinion. Thank you. Even you if it around was, the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. There were there were some negative <laughs> comments on there, but uh, you know, we love you guys all the same. Um have a great night, everybody. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye. All right.